My name is Jean Drusido. I'm the director of the Kent State University Museum, and I'd like to take you through the exhibition that celebrates 25 years of the Kent State University Museum with 250 years of fashion and 25 pieces. I'm really standing in front of the oldest pieces in the exhibition, and I'll move aside so that you can get a better view of the wonderful, very formal English mantua that was restored by a senior fashion design major. The fabric for that dress was made about 1745. The dress in its configuration when we got it in the museum looked like it was sort of 1770 remade for fancy dress. So Christina Hill took it apart and we had 57 pieces that fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And we were able to take it back to its earliest um, configuration, at least the earliest that we have fabric for, and that's about 1750. Uh, the panniers, the side hoops that keep the dress extended so wide at the hip, are about 56 inches across. When you went through a door, you either went sideways, or the doors were wide enough to accommodate you, or if your panniers were so contrived, uh, they could collapse so that you could go through the door. Camlet is an interesting fabric. It's made out of silk and wool and some kind of hair. Uh, the, the kind of hair varies, but it is so densely woven that it's actually nearly waterproof. And so the English gentlemen who lived in the countryside could ride through the brambles in their camlet coats and brush them off and it wouldn't damage them very much. It was in considerable opposition to the French fashion of silks and velvets. The English gentleman could go from the country to the city uh, in his camlet coat. Next to the blue and silver dress is the first example of what we call a round gown. For almost a hundred years, the fashion was for an open robe and petticoat. In other words, an expansive skirt and then an overdress that was open down the middle and the middle filled in with a triangular piece called a stomacher. And you can see that in the, in the blue and silver dress as well. The round gown was the first garment to close in the front uh, in the 18th century. And of course, without that split down the front, it was a round gown. This particular dress is made of a very, very sheer cotton called mull. Usually mull was uh, woven in India of very, very fine threads and then exported. Sometimes it was embroidered in India. It's very difficult to know exactly where the textile was embroidered, but they were embroidered to the shape uh, that would be cut and finished like this particular gown. We're moving around the gallery in chronological order, and the next gown, the white dress, is from about 1829. It's decorated with Ayrshire needlework, which is a combination of, of embroidery and drawn and pulled thread work. But the most dramatic thing about this dress are its sleeves. In contrast to the round gown that you saw just moments ago, which is so narrow and so slender and which sought to replicate antique statuary, this dress now is the beginning of the romantic movement in fashion, and you have uh, the widening of the sleeve and the widening of the skirt. That width at the, at the hem is accented by, not only by the decoration, but by the ruffles as well. This is the largest extent of the leg of mutton sleeve until you get to the 1890s when it reappears. Behind the white dress is a bronze dress, a kind of beigey brown, bronzy silk uh, from the 1830s. That was a very popular color in the 1830s. Now remember, up to this time, you're only seeing colors with natural dyes, meaning dyes extracted from vegetable and animal uh, matter. The shawl was a very popular accessory. It was brought to England, of course, from the Far East, uh, from India, from Kashmir, and it was worn in the 18th century, but people really believe that it was popularized by the Empress Josephine. Um, in France, and that Napoleon brought some of those shawls to her from some of his campaigns. They were extremely expensive, very luxurious, and of course, they became quite a fashion. The 1840s, you'll notice, suddenly the sleeve is long and slender. 
the fullness of the skirt is at the, is at the waistline, and the skirt begins to widen even more than it, than it had in the decades before. And by the time you get to the 1850s, which is the little flounce dress um, on the right, you can see how wide and bell-shaped these skirts have become. It's a very sheer cotton, and it was worn by a woman who lived in Mississippi. I want you to appreciate all the layers that go under these garments and think about a Mississippi summer. Uh, next to the skin you have a shift, over the shift you have a corset, over the corset you have uh, sometimes drawers and petticoats, uh, and many petticoats in order to keep your skirt as full as possible. In this case, the um, dress requires undersleeves as well, uh, and they only reach uh, to above the elbow. But nonetheless, it's another layer. All of the petticoats that were worn under the dresses in the 1840s and 50s were pretty dangerous for a lot of women. If a spark flew from the fireplace while you were cooking and caught your petticoats on fire, you were in pretty serious shape. In 1856, when the Thompson Cage crinoline was patented, people began to realize what a relief it was to wear these concentric hoops of steel uh, held together in a particular configuration by tapes and that they then fastened around the waist so that instead of multiple petticoats that were heavy because they had to be starched in order to stand out, you had a single petticoat, sometimes with a lightweight overskirt, uh, to hold out the dresses. Here you see a dress from the 1860s and it's supported by a cage crinoline. By the late 1860s, really by about 1865, when this dress was probably worn, the shape of the fashionable silhouette had changed. It was no longer the bell shape of the 1850s, but it was more elliptical. The fullness was pushed from the front to the back, and you can just begin to see the formation of a bustle. Cage crinoline allowed this to happen very readily because you could change the configuration of the hoops by the placement of the tapes that held them together. Throughout the 19th century, there were very carefully understood reasons for wearing certain kinds of garments at certain times. Really, it, it's a long tradition of what's appropriate to wear at court, in the presence of certain dignitaries, what's appropriate to wear at home. And in fact, there are tongue-in-cheek cartoons about women changing clothes every hour of the day in order to wear something that they consider to be appropriate. So far in the exhibition, you've seen a very formal mantua in the 18th century that would have been worn for a very important occasion, but not in the presence of royalty because it didn't have a train. You've seen dresses that would be appropriate for the morning at home, dresses that are appropriate for the afternoon, the dress from the 1860s is a ball gown. And here you have two dresses from the 1870s and the 1880s, the bustle period. The gray silk file dress on the left is a visiting dress. There were elaborate rituals for calling during the late Victorian era. And you wanted to be very certain that you were dressed appropriately. Now, the dress is just fancy enough, and because it has a train, it may in fact have been appropriate to wear at a reception as well. The dress next to it is definitely a ball gown because it has a low neck and very, very short sleeves. Generally, the lower the neckline and the shorter the sleeves, the more formal the evening occasion. The silver brocading on the, on the white satin is really wonderful, and of course the front of the dress is covered with silver bead fringe. You can only imagine how it would wiggle and shake as she walked. In the 20 years between 1890 and 1910, considerable changes took place in the feminine silhouette, and of course in the corsetry that created it. In this gallery view, you see an evening dress from the middle of the 1890s, about 1895, with the evening version of the leg of mutton sleeve, the robin's egg blue dress decorated in silver. 
In the middle is a dress from about 1900. And this is a lovely coral velvet. But the shape of this dress is an S curve. And the corset forces the bosom into what's called the powder pigeon or the monobosom. And you sort of jut out in front and jut out behind. Look at the figure on the far right of this gallery view. Look how narrow it is, how straight it is. This was a return to the neoclassicism. If you remember the round gown that we saw, uh, the first scene in the gallery, the round gown was the first of the neoclassic periods. And here you have, at the beginning of the 20th century, fashion looking back 100 years and straightening the silhouette once again. The pink and silver evening dress dates from about 1915 to 18. Notice that for the first time you're seeing the ladies' ankles. This is an enormous change as well. Part of it was brought about by the fact that women were beginning to work uh, to need more mobility because of the athletic things they did, because of the changes in lifestyle after the Victorian and Edwardian periods. It also reflects some of the changes brought about by World War I when women were working outside the home, taking um, jobs that were normally held by men and where they needed more mobility than previous fashion had allowed. This dress is by Lucille, Lady Duff Gordon. Uh, perhaps she's most notorious for forcing her husband off the Titanic and into a lifeboat. He was one of the few men that did not drown. Next to the Lucille is a marvelous dress by Coco Chanel. This is so interesting because the long fringes uh, are attached to a piece of blue chiffon that simply wraps around the body and forms the dress on top of a very uh, plain silk undergarment. A model of this dress was worn by the actress Marion Morehouse and was pictured in Vogue in 1926. This is a gift from the Helen Borowitz collection.